So, uh, this little outline of my presentation today. I'm going to give a quick introduction. I'm going to talk about how things were done in the past and how things have evolved and what we do today with, uh, within AWR and VSS, our visual system simulator. I'm going to cover a little bit of an example we did with Infineon Technologies and show some results measured and simulated, uh, do some conclusions, and followed by some acknowledgments. So, the way things have evolved lately, we're doing higher order modulation schemes. Things have changed a bit. More complex signals go into amplifiers, and because of those demands from the system level going down on the amplifier designers, that has to change the way we simulate things. One of the key trade-offs is efficiency versus the performance parameters, like linearity, for example. Back in, uh, say, you know, the 90s, even early 2000s, those metrics were measured by output, at, output intercept point. This was okay. He said 43 dBm, put the checkbox, the part's fine. But, you know, as things evolve, we, we're requiring a lot more than that. Instead of this simple plot right here, we have a far more complex plot like we have here. So if system engineers are requiring this, what's the PA designer supposed to do? Well, some techniques we've used in the past, harmonic balance. Can this do something like this? Well, is it practical? I mean, you have to have so many spectral frequencies. There's time and memory requirements, which means your computer needs a lot of memory and it takes a lot of time to simulate. Every time you change something, you re-simulate, this takes a lot of time. The whole point of doing the simulation is to save time. So that's not necessarily practical. And also, you can't do the demodulation. There's also the transient approach, so time domain. That would work well. However, you have to do about 10 times the Nyquist rate at the highest harmonic frequency in order to get the information you need. So that's going to take, that's going to be a bit too slow as well. So what's the solution? Well, if you use a system simulator like we have today and we've had for the last 10 years, you can do system level simulation. Uh, you can put in complex signals, LTE, WiMAX, and this is all a time domain simulation. And we have something called an NLS block. It's not a nonlinear block, points to an amplifier. It's great for complex modulated signals. There's one big problem, though. It can be frequency dependent, but it relies on interpolation. And we all know interpolation is a fancy way of saying made up data. So what, that's a little bit of a problem there. Um, another big problem, it only has an input and an output. And we care about things about, like efficiency, as I mentioned earlier. That's very important. With an RF in and an RF out, how are you going to know what the efficiency is? You need to know what's going on with your current and your voltage. And it's really only set up for amplifiers because it's relying on AM to AM and AM to PM data. And so you can't do things like mixers and ch frequency shifts and things like that. And lastly, it's not a dynamic model. So things aren't changing real time as you change the signal. So what do we do? We use circuit envelope. So this technology, it's been around for a while. It has a long history, but always moved around a bit. So it's kind of a combination of harmonic balance and transient simulation. And it's also done within the system tool. So it has you know, advantage over the time domain because you don't have to do at nearly all those, as many samples as you did before. So you can get your answers a lot faster. And you just need to capture the bandwidth of the modulation envelope. So this is kind of a pictorial of showing you know, how you look over time. You look at your harmonic balance results at certain time steps. That allows you to get the answers faster. And so it also captures things that you're trying to look into, like memory effects or things like that. So what can you do with circuit envelope? Number one, you overcome those limitations we talked about with just the NLS element. It's frequency dependent. You can have multiple inputs and outputs, you know, RF in, RF out. You can do DC in, DC out. You look at your voltage, your current versus time. All those, all those pieces of data that we want to look for so we can get these comp this this information that we need to do these complex signals for LTE, for example. It can handle the frequency conversion and it's a dynamic model. So this opens up the door to things like polar modulation, envelope tracking, memory effects, automatic gain control, the list goes on. So let's see what it looks like. This is kind of, so to speak, circuit envelope in action. This is a system diagram, just like you would place an NLS element. 
The only difference being, I know it's really small, see it up there, is the NLS envelope. Looks almost identical to the NLS, except it's got those two very important probes. You've got the voltage going in, and down below it is a monitor. You can, mo for example, monitoring PAE. So what's inside this block? Well, instead of being data, you know, measured data, AM to AM data, AM to PM, you actually have a microwave office schematic. So this is the amplifier your amplifier designer has designed. And so that's underneath there. So this one, for example, as I mentioned before, this is an Infineon amplifier that was used. I'll get into a little more details about what the part is later. But this is just a regular old, old fashioned schematic. It's got the bias. It's got all the information you need. It's got the ability to probe the currents. So this is the part we decided to use uh, when we partnered up with Infineon to do some testing of this theory. And it's a PTFB 212503. It's uh, meant for LTE designs. Um, I know it says they're multi-carrier 3G PP, not to be confused with 3G. That's just a, a standard settings, but it's really 4G. And it's a 2.1 gigahertz using WCDMA. It's LDMOS technology using some internal matching. And uh, it optimized, the matching is optimized for bandwidth and performance. So this is, uh, on the left side, You'll see that's the microwave office layout of the PC board, the evaluation board with the device on it, and over the right is a photograph of the actual device that was tested in the lab. And another view of the same thing in 3D. And so this is the test setup. We use the uh, National Instruments Pixie system and LabVIEW to set up the measurements and the simulation, which is co-simulating with VSS, our, si our system simulator. And here we can see the results. Um, I know the numbers are very small there, but trust me, they're all the same. So, uh, 35.2 dBc, 35.6, all very close, very good agreement between the measured and the simulated results. So to kind of wrap things up, you know, being able to simulate these kind of complex waveforms is one thing, but to be able to go in and actually see what's going on at the device level allows you to do further optimization of these amplifier designs. It goes a lot further than just the simple OIP3 measurements and things we've, we've been doing for the last you know, 10, 15, 20, even 30 years. Um, this allows us to you know, handle uh, larger bandwidths without any of the speed limitations we discussed by being, being restricted to harmonic balance only, time domain only. It kind of marries the two together in order to get you a faster solution. And as we could see from the results, uh, the simulation and the measurement, they were getting very good agreement. So as long as like, everything is good in terms of the circuit level design, you can expect to see good results up at the system level. And so it's going to capture all these impairments that we've been looking for. If you want to see memory effects, you want to see thermal effects, it's going to capture that because it's happening down at the circuit level and it's simulated at the system level. So unless there are any questions, uh, that'll wrap up the talk. I do want to give out some acknowledgments though. Um, I'd like to give thanks to Cindy Blair at Infineon Technologies. She, set, she did the design, the layout, the testing. Olivia Law at Infineon took those pictures for me at very last minute. And uh, over at AWR, I'd like to thank Josh Moore, Albert Santos, Taisto, and Timo for their work in the development of the technology to be able to do this for simulation. Are there any questions? All right, thank you.